I'm here this morning to tell you about a community that's been around since the very beginning. However, this is a community that we haven't really well understood until recently. In fact, this is a community that we've definitely discriminated against, we've gone to war with, we've designed weapons to specifically fight and kill members of this community. So you're probably wondering, who is this unseen, unknown, and honestly, a little underappreciated community? Well, I'd like to share them with you now. Maybe. I don't know. They're a little shy. I'd like to introduce you to uh, some of my friends and some of yours, in fact, as it would seem. That is not them. All right, well, that's me. Uh, so I guess we're still keeping it a secret. That's me when I was little. Um, and I always knew I wanted to be a marine biologist. I uh, spent a lot of time at the beach. And uh, I even actually knew I wanted to be a marine biologist in Hawaii from a, from a pretty young age. But I wasn't exactly sure studying what. And it was this unseen community that began to spark my interest in uh, what became sort of my future in, in science. So I began three years of research at the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education. And I distinctly remember my interview, because it went something like this. They're asking a bunch of questions, and they got to the question, so Paul, how much do you know about marine microbes? And I said I had heard of the word microbe, and I assumed since they said marine, they lived in the ocean, but that was about all I knew. Um, so if you're in a similar boat this morning, you haven't heard about marine microbes before, it's OK. I didn't know anything either. But it turns out microbes in the ocean are incredible. Uh, so they produce a ton of oxygen, which we breathe. It actually turns out that microbes in the ocean produce more oxygen than, say, the rainforests of our planet. Uh, sometimes they form these aggregations, which you can see. Uh, so this is a, a bloom of some of those. And you know, they're just huge, incredible powerhouses taking in carbon dioxide, sunlight, and producing the oxygen which we breathe. Now, microbial com communities in the ocean actually sometimes look a little bit more like this. Can you see them? I can't. Uh, they're very, very small. They're incredibly small. Um, there's one named Prochlorococcus. It's an incredible microbe. Um, just as an example, everybody take a breath in and let it out. So a fifth of you in the room alone can thank Prochlorococcus for that breath of oxygen. That's how much oxygen they're producing, and you don't really see them. Now, I was interested in this microbial ocean. I wanted to learn more about it, and so I found myself down at the Kualo Marine Laboratory. So that's just down in Kaka'ako. You're welcome to come visit me anytime if you'd like. And uh, this is the system I work on. It's a little unusual. So its name is Hydroides elegans. That's its scientific name. It actually doesn't have a common name, so you have to learn the scientific name. The scientific name is Hydroides elegans. And it's a marine worm. It's an incredible marine worm. Uh, so the pictures on the top, those are its larval stage, and then it becomes an adult worm. It, it metamorphoses. Uh, maybe the last time you heard the word metamorphos was like high school biology. Um, so just as a review, um, if you had something like a caterpillar, you know, and then it becomes a cocoon and a butterfly, that's, that's metamorphosis. Um, so something very similar happens with this marine worm. In fact, it happens with a lot of things in the ocean. They have a larval stage, and then they become adults. Um, and so, you know, we're talking about community. There's a great community down at the lab. Um, this is my advisor on the left, Michael Hadfield. He's actually been studying the system of hydroides for almost 50 years now. Um, so it's a good foundation. And the man on the right, that's uh, my research advisor. His name is Brian Nedved, and he's awesome. And he's also helped provided some of the pictures um, for today's talk, of which I'm very thankful. Now, hydroides is this tube worm. Uh, so when it be does become an adult, it forms this calcareous tube, and it has this like feathery appendage on its head that it filters water with, and it takes in uh, bacteria and phytoplankton, and that's how, that's how it lives, that's how it feeds. So I was talking a little bit about this metamorphic process before. Um, what's incredible is not only the amount of change that happens in hydroides, but what causes it. What causes it actually turns out to be something interesting. So this is a video of hydroides. 
Um, it's, so it's a little worm, and what it's actually doing is it's searching around on a glass slide that's coated in bacteria. And what happens is, uh, you know, Hydroides is a very smart worm. Uh, it doesn't just choose to live anywhere, but it finds a very specific place. I mean, you would want to learn about the neighborhood before you moved in. Um, it's sort of similar. It finds a good microbial community, um, and that's when it begins to undergo this incredible change from being a free-swimming larva that does not look like a worm into the, the adult worm form. So maybe at this point you're thinking, Paul, this is wonderful and lovely, but I am not a marine worm. Uh, bacteria has nothing to do with me. But that's not entirely true. Um, it turns out there are actually 10 bacterial cells for every one human cell in your body. So maybe you're more bacteria than you are human. <laughs> to prove a point, I'd like everybody to raise their right hand and then place it on your stomach. So your stomach has a lot of bacteria in it, and I want to introduce you to one specific one. So this is Bacteroides theta iotamicron. This bacteria lives in your stomach, and what's incredible is it actually has enzymes which digest carbohydrates that your body can't. So without this bacteria, you wouldn't get the energy from that type of food. It's, it's pretty cool. I think it's really cool. <laughs> um, but bacteria not only live within us, they do a lot of important things in our world. So here's another bacteria. Uh, actually, it's a yeast. My apologies. It's a microbe. It's a yeast. It's a Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And this yeast um, is really important for things like brewing beer or eating bread. Um, it's really important in the fermentation process. So if you like beer or bread, you can thank this microbe. Uh, how about Penicillium roqueforti? So penicillin, that's the genus name, might sound familiar. Yes, it is related to the penicillin. Um, and then Roquefortii actually is responsible for Roquefort cheese. So they actually you know, stick it out there, and it, it's actually these microbes that give it that incredible taste that people are so fond of. And there's one last story I want to tell you about microbes. And so this is actually a marine bacteria. Its name is Zobelia galactinivoriens. And it has this very specific set of enzymes which are responsible for breaking down seaweed, or nori. Um, so these set of enzymes are found exclusively in marine bacteria, with one exception. They're found one other place. They're found in the stomachs of Japanese people. <laughs> so it's really interesting to think about maybe who we are is somehow reflected in our microbial community. And it's really interesting. So this is a very new field. It's a lot of new science. And something we're learning is that things like bacteria may actually be influencing our mood, personality, our behavior. I can't say any of that for certain yet, but definitely keep your eye out. It'll be interesting to see what happens in this field in the coming years. So if we're thinking about microbes and community. How do we cultivate community? So what I'm not suggesting is I'm not suggesting you go out and find a microbe-rich piece of moss and take a huge bite out of it. That might not be good for you. Also, you can keep washing your hands. It's fine to wash your hands. It's a good thing to do. But instead, what I'm suggesting is that we need to cultivate a different mindset. We've always seen microbes as scary, or bad, or infectious, or evil. They're really not evil. Um, they've been around for a really long time, and they've been doing a lot of really good things for a really long time. And maybe it's just because we don't always see them. Maybe that's what makes it scary. Uh, it makes me sometimes think about the way we see science in general. Because we don't always see what's happening in science, it comes off as scary or weird or confusing. So I asked a, I asked a bunch of my friends, I asked a bunch of people, I said, you know, why are people so afraid of science? What, what scares them? There's something, I just feel like people are innately afraid of things in science. And the overwhelming response I got was, people are afraid of what they don't know. That got me thinking, what if we lived in a world in which we knew everything? To be honest, I think it would be incredibly boring. Um, one of the greatest benefits, I think, of getting to be a scientist, I consider myself incredibly lucky, incredibly lucky. The reason that is, is when I wake up every morning, I get to think about questions that no one's ever thought of, and I get to go out and do weird experiments, or try something new. Try to learn something new. The whole idea is you don't have to do what's done, been done before because 
No one knows what's going to happen. It's exciting. Um, so we have to, to think about this in terms of science, too, you know, and just in general, in the public. If we, if we learn this new thing from science, don't be afraid of it. Now, OK, I'm more familiar with microbes, so I'm less afraid of them. But take something like dark matter. I know nothing about dark matter. I am not a quantum physicist. I have a good physicist friend. Every time he explains it, I don't understand a word he's saying. But I know dark matter is important. And I know it's holding the universe together. And that just blows my mind. And I think that's really cool. So maybe instead of just being freaked out by things we don't know, we can embrace them and say, all right, I don't exactly understand what's happening, but the fact that it is is really fascinating. And I want to learn more about what's out there. Now, you know, this is, this is a scary concept. Uh, I understand that. So I want everybody to take a deep breath in. Let it out. Remember to thank the microbes because, you know, they produce the oxygen. And then take a step from this old paradigm into a new paradigm. A new paradigm that says, I will no longer be afraid of microbes. I will no longer be afraid of science. Because it's a beautiful world. We have an opportunity here to learn new things, to explore. So thank you so much for your time this morning.